All right, everybody, if we can uh, start coming back up front, grab your seats. I'm really excited for this next conversation. All right, so shortly we're going to have on stage here uh, the Honorable Scott Morrison, who's the 30th Prime Minister of Australia, who's the Prime Minister from 2018 to 2022, so a few things happened during his tenure. I think uh, critical to our conversation here today is going to be around AUKUS, uh, which he implemented for the Australians, uh, which is a critical piece for a lot of people in this, in this uh, room and a lot of people uh, here with us today out in the, in the booth. So please uh, you know, listen up for that, that kind of piece of the discussion. He also was the Prime Minister during COVID, so you can talk about COVID response there. So this one will be a, a, a slight change. We're not going to be using Slideo for this. We will have microphones floating around, so he's got some, some opening remarks uh, that he, he will speak to, and then we're going to have microphones. Please wait for the microphone to come, so it's a, it's a rather large room, uh, but we'll have those microphones around. Just raise your hand, but yeah, yeah, so major topics to go over, really, the implementation of AUKUS, how that went, and his tenure as uh, the 30th Prime Minister of Australia. So without further ado, the Honorable Scott Morrison. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, good day, everyone. It's good to see you. Um, it's wonderful to be here in DC again. And uh, I'm great to be here with my good friends from, from Dine Ventures, who uh, I teamed up with uh, after I left politics, uh, along with someone else you probably know, Secretary Pompeo. And uh, we've been uh, working together in a, a key part of where I see why we actually did AUKUS in the first place. What I thought I'd do this morning for you is just give you the background of where did this come from, why did we do it, and, and what's next, and how can you all be involved. Uh, in, in about 2016, 17, what we saw in the Indo-Pacific, particularly from Australia's perspective, and I was the Treasurer of Australia at the time, is we had seen the, uh, the sort of overt way that the PRC once upon a time uh, used to assert its influence in our country and in our region uh, became um, you know, quite pronounced and, and very revealed. And what they were seeking to do, whether it was entrenching Huawei and ZTE in our telecommunications, whether it was foreign interference in, through Confucius Institutes in our universities, uh, whether it was frankly just direct attempts to manipulate our political system, all of this was going on and our government uh, took a very strong position. And the reason we did that is we had seen what had happened in the past, where China had sought to uh, move forward, particularly into the South China Sea, and no one said anything. And the lesson, I think, of history is that if you let authoritarian regimes and autocrats just keep marching towards you, they will keep marching until you tell them to stop, until, you, until you're in a position to say and back that up uh, with your own actions. And so as we saw, I think, what, what was a revealed and quite transformational um, uh, path that China was now on, we formed the view that we had to say no and we had to say stop. Now at that time the, the Trump administration here had, had said the same thing. Uh, it was actually from memory it was Vice President Pence who first got up at the Hudson Institute here in DC uh, and gave pr probably the strongest speech in relation to what was happening in the PRC in the Indo-Pacific we had ever heard. And that was followed up at the APEC meeting, where I, which I attended as, as Prime Minister that, later that year. And it was another strong presentation, and I gave a very similar one. And so Australia, from that time to this, and it has been bipartisan in terms of understanding the risks in the Indo-Pacific, has taken a very strong position, just as it has been here on a bipartisan basis in the United States. So Australia and the United States have had, the, I think, the clearest eyed view, together with Japan, on what has been occurring in the region and what is required uh, to provide a credible deterrent uh, so that we do not see the entire region um, basically go to pieces. Now, another thing that was happening at the same time was Boris Johnson was Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. And uh, Boris and I were good friends and the trilateral relationship between Australia, the United States and the United Kingdom, I would describe as probably the most trusted partnership between three countries, values based anywhere in the world. And the three of us were seeing the world, this, and particularly the Indo-Pacific, the same way. And with 
the advent of Brexit, this provided the UK with the opportunity to take a, a more independent position when it came to, to these types of partnerships, particularly on the other side of the world. Um, while the US and Australia had been very involved for obvious reasons of geography in the Indo-Pacific, it had not quite been the same case with the UK. And I was very keen to see that we were drawing uh, the UK and others into our region and getting them to focus on what was happening. And so from that, as a result of the bullying and the coercion that was being uh, inflicted on Australia um, for our, our great crimes of, of saying that uh, we would decide who got to invest in our country, who would build our telecommunications networks, um, that our parliamentarians would be able to um, speak freely, that our press could be free, um, that all of these things that occurred, which was taken at great offence, we decided that we had to put together a deterrent partnership that would do two things. The first was, that Australia would need to have nuclear powered, not nuclear armed submarine technology that would enable us to operate deep into the places that we needed to operate in and uh, to ensure uh, that we had the capability to do that um, for a very long period of time. And that that capability would be integrated um, with the similar capabilities here in the United States and also in the United Kingdom. And for the first time since the late 50s, the United States agreed uh, to provide that, what we call the holy grail of defence technology to Australia. Other prime ministers had tried before. Um, other nations and other allies had, had made this request. Um, but we had been able to work uh, to a position, particularly through our, through our involvement in the Five Eyes, um, where we had moved into a, a new plane of our level of trust and uh, cooperation with the United States. That had occurred certainly under the Trump administration and had continued on under the Biden administration. So we had this unique opportunity. The unique opportunity was also a function of the fact that we had previously entered into a, a commercial arrangement with the Naval Group to build diesel-powered subs. Now, there was nothing wrong with their design of diesel-powered subs. The problem was that diesel-powered subs were no longer going to be able to deal with the strategic environment that we would be operating in when they got wet. And my concern was is that the minute they got wet, they'd probably be obsolete. And so we needed to have a, a plan B. And for once, plan B was going to be better than plan A. And so we worked steadily over the course of about 18 months, all through COVID actually, and uh, both under both administrations, and got to the point where we were able to crystallise this arrangement in September of 2021, following uh, a trilateral meeting in June of uh, 2021 in the UK in Carbis Bay, where um, we agreed that we would go ahead and ensure that between the three countries there would be more nuclear-powered submarines. I think one of the misgivings and one of the um, uh, areas of misunderstanding about AUKUS is it's not about displacing submarine capability from the United States to Australia or from the UK to Australia for that matter. Um, the point is to have more nuclear-powered submarines and to ultimately get to a fleet of some 70 between the three of us which is more interoperable, um, we would have similar weapon systems operating, particularly the newer ones that are developed, and this would be a more permanent and integrated force than the likes of which we hadn't seen before. And so I had a lot of sympathy, particularly here on the Hill, when those who had concerns about, well, you know, when these three Virginias go to Australia, where's that going to leave us? Well, the whole point is, is that we need the US to maintain the tempo of their building of nuclear powered submarines here. We want the US to have as many as they can possibly build and we want to be able to access the ones that we've uh, entered into arrangements to secure. And then there's the AUKUS, uh, SSNR AUKUS submarine, which is being developed and will be built in the UK and Australia with, with US weapon systems that then becomes part of that, that fleet, which can be deployed for the purposes of a more secure Indo-Pacific. So that's what pillar one of the AUKUS agreement is. And as we worked <laughs> tortuously and, and, uh, and, and tenaciously over a course of about 18 months, what occurred to me was that we don't want to have to do this every single time that we want to develop trilateral defence capability between these three countries. We should be starting this process in the room at the same time when we spec it, when we design it, when we uh, procure it, and then when we operate it. And there has to be a consistent line of thinking because we, we lose too much time then trying to fit everything back into our own systems later. And so 
what we agreed to do in AUKUS was not just to do the submarines, but it was recognising that advanced defence technologies um, would be the thing that would uh, strike the distance between us and, and rivals and competitors and adversaries, and that we'd be able to maintain that distance. And so Pillar 2 focuses on a series of, of advanced defence technologies, uh, undersea, um, hypersonics, pardon me, AI, quantum, uh, precision uh, weapons, all of these things, and ensuring that we're testing, developing, and most importantly, harnessing the energy of the private sector. Because the one advantage we have, I think, over our adversaries and rivals, is that we have a private sector and defence industrial base. And while we talk about the need to have advantage in so many of the spheres uh, where you must have uh, militarily, the one where we need to focus even more, whether it's here in the United States or elsewhere, is ensuring that our private defence industrial base is match fit and is in a position to get stronger and stronger uh, so we can deal with the demands going forward. And so this is what AUKUS was designed to do. It was, it was not just supposed to, to be designed for three governments and three militaries to work together. It was about creating an integrated defence industrial space uh, in defence industrial base ecosystem that would operate all together. Now that meant regulatory changes, it meant changes to export controls, it meant, it meant uh, uh, changes to the way that people can move between countries and work on, on very sensitive projects. And so that work has begun uh, and, and just at the end of last year um, we were very successful in seeing those first bills pass and the support in the Congress has been absolutely fantastic and in Australia we're very appreciative of that. And uh, this is really starting to get some momentum. And that was one of the key messages I wanted to leave with you. And that is AUKUS has momentum. It has bipartisan support. Uh, I believe it has bipartisan support. Well, it certainly has been had demonstrated bipartisan support here in the Congress. But it has in Australia with the change of government. And I have no doubt that will be the case also in the United Kingdom, where it has already been under two prime ministers. And if there were to be a change there, I think that would continue as well. But for it to continue to be successful, it will need further commitment and investment and participation of the industry. And I think that is a big challenge for the governments who oversee this. And if I was still in that role as Prime Minister, the thing I'd be asking, and I'm sure the leaders are now, is what is getting in the way? Are the demand signals strong enough to encourage the participation and the investment that is necessary uh, to ensure we can deliver on those capability requirements and the innovation that will ensure that we're able to keep um, pace um, with where we need to go in the future and more importantly, strike distance. Um, because if we have that, then the calculus, which Xi Jinping does every morning, and they do it in Paycom every morning, um, will go in our favour and increasingly go in favour, which is the desired outcome at the end of the day. And we can avoid uh, what none of us want to see happen. But my message here is that the defence industrial base, the private defence industrial base here is is the X factor in this deal. Um, plenty of countries have worked together before, uh, plenty of governments have worked together before, plenty of militaries have worked together before, but the thing that I think is really going to energise this is the ability of the defence industrial base across three jurisdictions to work together. Now, let me make two other quick points. Um, the first one is that while AUKUS, I believe, will always be a trilateral arrangement, um, that does not mean it will be an exclusive arrangement when it comes to um, particular technologies. And uh, the idea of AUKUS Plus is starting to get some uh, currency, uh, particularly in relation to Japan and South Korea, um, whether it's you know, groups like Hanwha or, um, uh, or, or Mitsubishi Heavy Industries or these types of groups. Um, we've got these countries, particularly in Japan, significantly upping their spend in, in their defence sectors, which will see uh, an expansion of their defence and industrial base. We want to tap into that and in down particular streams that in can occur with Pillar 2. And so the partnerships that you may be forming um, with country and countries and, more importantly, companies in countries outside of the US, um, that, I don't believe, should or will um, preclude uh, uh, participation in, in these projects. Uh, New Zealand is another, Canada is another, and uh, we want to see basically that sphere that is looking to put a, a counterbalance and a deterrent in place in the Indo-Pacific uh, to be able to operate across all of those levels. Uh, so th that is important. Um, the other thing that is important is we just need to keep 
understanding what these barriers are and just keep knocking them down. Um, I haven't seen as much will, particularly here in the US, and I believe AUKUS has achieved this, for there to be an appetite to deal with those changes. Things that have been driving you guys nuts, and I know in Australia nuts for decades, um, there is a real opportunity to move the needle on those things and clear away some of those hurdles, which means these projects that can become a reality. And frankly, there needs to be a sense of urgency about it because at the end of the day, it's fairly existential um, that we're able to develop these capabilities in our defence industry and that they're cohesive and they're all part of one ecosystem. Um, so that's where we're working. That's what AUKUS is trying to do. Um, it has already begun that process. It has very short term, very, very near term um, objectives, particularly when it comes to some of these new capabilities and, and I'd say particularly un with undersea autonomous right through to the ultimate delivery of SSN AUKUS, um, the, ma uh, the development of, of Fleet Based West in, 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 in Australia and ultimately Fleet Based East where we'll be able to um, not only run our own subs from these places but we'll be able to take and maintain and support um, the, uh, the subs from our partners in the United States and the UK which will involve a greater rotation of presence um, up through the region. Um, the other thing it's doing is, you know, and you'll all be struggling with this, no doubt, as we do right across the Western world, um, the training of people, um, having the right engineers, having the right um, uh, commanders, those who have been able to work in, in, on multiple different platforms, in multiple different jurisdictions, and uh, be able to make the AUKUS um, dream an, a reality when it comes to operating. Uh, so they're the challenges we've got ahead. Um, I'm pleased post-politics to be able to be working with Dime Ventures and many others to, to ensure that we can make that AUKUS objective and a reality. And I'm quite excited about the fact that there is, particularly here in the United States, how, how seriously people are taking it, both in industry and within government, and on both sides of the aisle. And uh, it really is up to all of us now to just make, make this thing work and to capitalise on the ch opportunity that's before us. Um, so hopefully Australians tend to speak quite quickly. I hope I wasn't speaking too quickly uh, for this time of the morning. Um, I'm happy to take some questions. If you've got some specific questions, I'm, I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to explain what cricket is, if that's what you'd like me to do, um, or what Australian rules football is, if you'd like me to do that, or that, that's not my game. My game is rugby league, and I can happily explain that to you, uh, and it'll be an absolute mystery by the time I've finished the explanation, I suspect, except for the Aussies, you're in the crowd. So I can't see with these lights, so people can just holler. Tell me where you're from, and... Okay, yeah. Mr. Prime Minister, uh, good to see you again. Mm. You talked about the key for AUKUS going forward being the commercialization piece. Mm. When you look at Pillar 2, what do you believe is going to be the first catalyst on the technology side to really spur kind of that government and private side partnership? I think the first catalyst is people are going to turn up with some capital and invest and take the risk. Because that's the leap. And I, I get that that leap is, is a hard one to make. And, uh, and I think, let's take undersea autonomous firstly, because I think that's where we'll see, I think the earliest movements and the first runs really get on the board when it comes to um, pillar two of AUKUS. Uh, it's certainly the case in Australia that unless these things have dual use applications, you're gonna make it very hard to make it stack up from an investment point of view. Um, I think the case here is just because of the size of budgets and so on is a, is a lot stronger. Um, but I wouldn't say without the dual use um, that it is necessarily an easy, uh, easy thing to do. So I'd, I'd say having the right type of funds in place that have clear objectives, um, I think very, very uh, focused objectives about what they're trying to do, just not spraying capital everywhere, but having a very clear mandate, uh, and which is giving investors, I think, a really clear understanding about um, what the outcomes are going to be, what the type of technology is, and uh, I think investors are looking for that specificity to mitigate their risk. And so, you know, investors dealing with uh, fund managers and others who know what they're doing, who know the space, and know how they can make it work. And once, you know, once you, we can get over that, 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 that valley of death, the, the, the hump, or whatever way you want to call it, where the capital actually starts to see the return, then I think um, Pillar 2 can really start to, to move. Now, that does require government budgets. Uh, to have an, a strong enough to demand signal to actually to pull this along. And that is absolutely essential and, and uh, Australia needs to do that. Uh, it also ha needs to happen here and is, needs to happen in the UK.
Just sing out and I'll, yeah. hey, here we go. I'm yep. over here. G'day. G'day, Scott. I'm Adam Leslie from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Hmm. Um, we do a, a lot of work um, engaging with investors and, and companies who are trying to take advantage of um, AUKUS. Um, and the most common complaint we hear is that there's no easy entry point. Hmm. Um, so for you, what does the front door to AUKUS look like? Well, ultimately, it's going to be a procurement once there's a, a, a settled pathway on some of these technologies about what they want to do. I think one of the things that, um, that whether it's Ministries of Defence or the Pentagon or the Department of Defence or the various procurement agencies have is they've got to, I think, spend a lot more time in, in answering the question, what is it they want? And uh, just because something's shiny and exciting and new and can do any number of things, I think um, them having a much more clear idea about what they're going to prioritise on their procurements, I think is going to give the industry a lot more confidence. And uh, you know, I don't think we're at that stage yet. I know there's a lot of um, interface going on between the various uh, um, uh, departments and procurement agencies to try and you know, inform the sector about what they're looking for. But I'd agree with you, I still think there's a, a lack of clarity on that and I think there's some confusion, so I think that needs to be tightened up. Um, but largely I think the front door is, is, is right across you know, every, every one of those procurement agencies across the, the three. The idea that you're necessarily going to have a, a trilateral procurement process I think is unlikely in most instances. I think it's going to happen with each of the partners where the, um, where the other partners are either backing in or supporting or, or have some uh, roll down down the line and you're going to see some of these technologies proven up uh, with one of the partners moving first. But the advantage then of AUKUS is that that's not happening in isolation or in a vacuum. The others are already part of the conversation about why that's useful. Uh, there are a number of uh, innovation trials and competitions and various things like that which are underway now. Uh, I know they're occurring in Australia. They've already done that uh, on Onda C, which I think is terrific. Um, but uh, you know, you, you, you all deal with these agencies all the time. And uh, I think uh, getting a, a bit more clarity about that would be a really helpful thing. All right, I think we have time for one more question way in back. on that in relation to some of the reforms uh, that are going in, on, in Australia. How do you see those two connecting and where do you still remain concerned, I guess? Oh, look, I think, it's a, I think it's a terrific start and it's the biggest shift we've seen, um, at least in my working life. Um, and I think that was enabled by the, uh, by the, the momentum generated by AUKUS. Um, but we, it, it, the job is far from done and there's licensing issues, there's stuff still around export controls. Um, there are things that still are, 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 that exist around immigration programs and, and, and visa issues. Um, th it's a pretty long list, but I've got to say, you know, within a year uh, of, the, uh, of the pathway being uh, set out, to be able to have progressed that through uh, the Congress by the end of last year, I was very encouraged by that. So uh, I think the key is to, to maintain the momentum and keep populating that list of things that. Uh, whether it's the Australian government here through Ambassador Rudd or, or through the UK government or your own government, um, that y you, keep, you keep the pressure on that list and it's an ongoing process and to keep uh, Congress members and, and the various relevant committees informed of what the next thing is um, because we don't want to lose the momentum of these changes because I think uh, the deregulation of that is, is what is going to massively de-risk the investment to take me back to the first question. Um, you know, if, if this thing is going to take forever and with an uncertain result and the regulatory thing is going to bog it all down, well, you know, that's, that's a pretty big risk premium you're going to attach to that and the capital is probably going to go into electric vehicles or something else. Um, so, you know, I, I think the governments have a, a big um, burden on them, as they should, to be able to maintain uh, the, uh, the momentum of these regulatory changes. So I'd, I don't believe remotely that what's already been achieved is the full picture that needs to be achieved. But I, I honestly think it's a very, very good start. And for I'm sure pretty much everyone in this room, you would have known the inertia uh, that has been present around some of these issues for a very, very long time. So I think it's starting to open up. Um, but as I say, one swallow doesn't make a summer. 
and uh, you know we, we need to see a lot more swallows. All right. Thank you very much, okay. the Honourable Scott Morrison. Thank you.